Hello, welcome to our CompTIA Security Plus course. In this lesson, we'll talk about what social engineering is, what are the social engineering types, and what are the tips to protect yourself from social engineering. So what is social engineering? Social engineering is the art of manipulating people, so they give up confidential information. The types of information these criminals are seeking can vary, but when individuals are targeted, the criminals are usually trying to trick you into giving them your passwords or bank information. Or maybe access your computer to secretly install malicious software that will give them access to your passwords and bank information, as well as giving them control over your computer. Criminals use social engineering tactics because it is usually easier to exploit your natural inclination to trust than it is to discover ways to hack your software. For example, it is much easier to fool someone into giving you their password than it is for you to try hacking their password, else unless the password is really weak, right? Now, in many circumstances, social engineering is the precursor to more advanced attacks. Social engineering is extremely successful because it relies on human emotions. Now, here are the common examples of social engineering. First, an attacker calls a valid user and impersonates a guest attempt agent or a new user asking for assistance in accessing the network or requesting details on the business processes of the organization. Next is that an attacker contacts a legitimate user and poses as a technical aid attempting to update some type of information. Now the attacker asks for identifying user details that can then be used to gain access. Next example is like an attacker poses uh, as a network administrator directing the legitimate user to reset the password to a specific value that an imaginary update can be applied. And lastly, an attacker provides the user with a helpful program or agent through email, a website, or some other means of distribution. And this program might require the user to enter login details or personal information that is useful to the attacker or it might install other programs that compromise the system security. Now, in the preceding examples, the attacker is using impersonation, which is a core tactic of social engineers, which simply means someone assumes the character or appearance of someone else, right? The attacker pretends to be something he or she is not, an impersonation is often used in conjunction with a pretext or an invented scenario. So here, there are a lot of great movies, right? And one of them is this one, which is Catch Me If You Can, on which the drama or humor unfolds as a result of impersonation and pretexting. In here, the actor impersonates a co-pilot and also in cashing a fake check, right, to a cashier. While social engineering is often used to gain information, Usually, the attacker uses public information sources to first do reconnaissance of the target. For example, LinkedIn or an organization's website may be used to identify personnel and their roles and responsibilities within the organization. And while this might seem like this fun and games, in many cases, fraud is involved. Another example is with identity fraud, a person's personal information is used without authorization to deceive or commit a crime. In fact, online impersonation is usually a crime. Even just uh, posing online as someone else without that person's consent is against the law. Now, let's talk about the different social engineering types. The first one is about tailgating, right? Tailgating is a simple yet effective technique in a social engineer's arsenal. It involves piggybacking or following closely behind someone who has authorized physical access in an environment. Tailgating involves appearing to be part of an authorized group or capitalizing on people's desire to be polite. 
A common example is an attacker following an authorized person and working to get the person to hold open a secure door to grant access. Many high security facilities employ man traps, which are like, like airlock like mechanisms that allow only one person to pass at a time to provide entrance control and prevent tailgating. Now, the next example is uh, dumpster diving. Now, as humans, we naturally seek the path of least resistance. So instead of shredding documents or walking them to the recycle bin, employees often throw them into the waste basket. Workers also might put discarded equipment into the garbage if CD laws that do not require special disposal. Intruders know this and scavenge for discarded equipment and document in an act called dumpster diving. They can extract sensitive information from the garbage without ever contacting anyone in the organization. In any organization, the potential risk of an intruder gaining access to this type of information is huge. Now, what happens when employees leave the organization? Right? They clean out their desk. Depending on how long the employees have been there, the material that ends up in the garbage can be a gold mine for intruders. There are also other potential sources of discarded information, which include organizational directories, employee manuals, hard drives, and other media and printed materials. So another example is shoulder surfing. Shoulder surfing involves looking over someone's shoulder to obtain information. It may occur while someone is entering a personal identification PIN at an automated teller machine or ATM or typing in a password at a computer system. More broadly, however, shoulder surfing includes any method of direct observation and could include, for example, locating a camera nearby or even using binoculars from a distance. With many of these types of methods, user awareness and training are key to prevention. Now, in, ad in addition, some tools can also assist here. For example, many ATMs now include mirrors so users can see who might be behind them and better designated keypads to help conceal key entry. Um, special screen overlays are available for laptop computers to prevent someone from seeing the screen at an angle. The consequences of getting caught shoulder surfing are low Simply peering over someone's shoulder to learn the combination is less risky than, say, breaking open a safe or attempting to open the safe when unauthorized. In fact, a shoulder surfer might not actually be the one to initiate a subsequent attack. Information security attacks have evolved into an ecosystem, right? The shoulder surfer's job might be complete after he or she provides or sells the information gleaned to someone else who has more nefarious goals. Now, one common method of social engineering is via electronic communication is called phishing. Phishing is an attempt to acquire sensitive information by masquerading as a trustworthy entity via electronic communication email. Phishing attacks rely on a mix of technical deceit and social engineering practices. In most cases, the phisher must persuade the victim to intentionally perform a series of actions that provides access to confidential information. As scum artists become more sophisticated, so do their phishing email messages. The messages often include official looking logos from real organizations and other identifying information taken directly from legitimate websites. For best protection, you must deploy proper security technologies and techniques at the client side, the server side, and the enterprise level. Many organizations now prepend to the subject line some sort of modification if the email is external and this practice is known as prepending. Ideally, users should not be able to directly access email attachments from within the email application. However, the best defense is user education. Now, related to social engineering methods with slight differences from basic phishing include the following. First is uh, spear phishing and whaling, right? So spear phishing, right? This is a targeted version of phishing where areas phishing often involves mass emailing, spear phishing goes after a specific individual. Now, what is whaling? Whaling is identical to 
spear fishing except for the size of the fish. Whaling employs spear fishing tactics but goes after high profile targets such as an executive within a company. Vishing is also known as a voice phishing. Vishing is the use of common fake caller ID to appear as a trusted organization in attempts to get an individual to enter account details via the phone. Next is a smishing. Smishing is also known as SMS phishing, which is used the use of phishing methods through um, test text messaging. And the next one is farming. Farming, it's actually a combination of farming and phishing. Farming does not require the user to be tricked into clicking a link. Instead, farming redirects victims from a legitimate site to a bogus website. Now, to accomplish this, the attacker employs another attack such as uh, DNS cache uh, poisoning. All right, so often an in initial phishing attempt could be a means to commit fraud. So the first one is the advanced fee scam. So in this scam, a large sum of money is promised, but the target is asked to make a small payment first in order to complete the transaction. And of course, the victim never sees the large return. Next is the invoice scam. In such attack, the threat actor may use well research in carefully crafted emails requesting for payment. Right? The hope is that the victim will follow standard processes for paying out invoices without giving much thought to the details of this particular payment. Next are watering hole attacks. In many ways, a watering hole attack is like spear phishing, right? That's what uh, have discussed earlier. However, instead of using email, the attacker attacks a site that Target uh, frequently visits. The goal is often to compromise the larger environment, for example, the company um, that the target works for, just, just as a lion waits hidden near a watering hole that zebras frequent, a watering hole attacker waits at the sites you frequent, right? In a typical scenario, the attacker first profiles and understands the victim, such as that what websites the victims visit and with what type of computer and web browser does it use. Next, the attacker looks for opportunities to compromise any of um, this uh, sites based on the existing vulnerabilities. Now, understanding more about the victim, like for example, the type of browser and use activities, helps the attacker compromise the site with the greatest chance of then exploiting the victim. Another example, right? A watering hole attack is commonly used in conjunction with the zero day exploit on which an attack against a vulnerability that is unknown to software and security vendors. The attacking advantage of a cross-site scripting vulnerability on the visited site, which allows the attacker to execute scripts in the victim's web browser. The attacker can ensure that the trusted site helps deliver an exploit to the victim's machine. Another example is typo squatting. Typo squatting, also known as URL hijacking, is a simple method used frequently for benign purposes, but it is also easily used for more malicious attacks. Typo squatting most commonly relies on typographic errors users make on the internet. It can be as simple as accidentally typing something like www.google.com with triple O instead of google.com. Uh, with two O's, right? Fortunately, in this example, Google owns both domain names and redirects the users who mistype the domain name to the correct domain. However, a misspelled URL of a travel website may take a user to a competing website. Certainly, any domain name can be slightly misspelled, but some typos are more commonly used than others. Now imagine that you unknowingly and mistakenly type in the wrong URL for your bank. Perhaps you just accidentally transpose a couple letters. Instead of being presented with a generic park domain for a domain registrar, you are presented with a site that looks just like your bank's. Attackers' variations and motives can vary, but the simplest attack is to simply record your login information. 
Perhaps after you try logging in, you see a message saying that your bank is undergoing website maintenance and will be back up in 24 hours. Now what you probably won't realize is that the attacker has access to your credentials and knows which site they can be used on. In the next one are hoaxes and influence campaigns. Hoaxes are interesting because although a hoax presents a threat, the threat does not actually exist at face value. Instead, the actions people take in response to perceived threat create the actual threats. For example, a hoax virus email can consume resources as it is forwarded on. In fact, a widely distributed and believed hoax about a computer virus can result in consequences as significant as an actual virus. Such hoaxes, um, particularly as they manifest themselves in the physical world, can create unnecessary fear and irrational behaviors. Most hoaxes are passed around not just via email, but also on social networks and by word of mouth. Hoaxes often find ways to make the rounds, again, even years per later, right? Perhaps altered only slightly. So, there's another one. Snopes.com is a well-known resource that has been around since uh, mid-1990s. So, if you're ever in doubt or need help in debunking hoaxes, make this site as part of your trusted um, arsenal. Now, while most um, hoax may appear benign, um, they have a more sophisticated counterpart, which is called the influence campaign. While influence campaigns are nothing new, the web, advertising, and social media have recently given influence campaigns greater visibility and awareness. Now, broadly, an influence campaign involves coordinated actions that seek to affect the development actions and behavior of the targeted population. And while there are campaigns that are perfectly legitimate and ethically run by businesses and organizations, influence campaigns have recently come into uh, include hybrid warfare. Conventional warfare is understood to be confrontational and use infantry and weaponry, but cyber warfare has recently become common among nations. Now, while influence campaigns, propaganda, and disinformation have been around for many centuries, their use has expanded largely due to the internet and specifically social media. The internet has provided an opportunity to widely disseminate information, and social media has provided an opportunity for it to spread. Hybrid warfare can and often does include a combination of these methods, but the psychological, economic, and political influence um, aspects go beyond just distraction to achieving greater goals, such as dividing public opinion by exploiting societal vulnerabilities. Now let's talk about the uh, principles of influence, or also called as the reasons for effectiveness. So as we stated earlier, right, social engineering relies on human psychology. Then in particular, a social engineer is looking to influence another person to gain something which is most often not in the target's best interest. In many cases, social engineering combines influence with manipulation. Given to this, let's look at the various principles of influence. The key challenge for the various principles of influence is that even though people might recognize a specific principle, they may not easily notice when it is being used against them for nefarious purposes. So, here are the following points to summarize key principles of influence and highlight why they are um, effective. So, the first one is uh, authority. Okay. This one. So, here, job titles, uniforms, symbols, badges, and even specific expertise are all elements we often equate with authority. With such proclaimed and believed authority, we naturally feel an obligation to comply. For example, flashing red lights would likely prompt you to pull over in the specific expertise of the IT security administrator or chief information security officer would probably compel you to divulge your password to aid in troubleshooting. In addition to feel, feeling a sense of obligation, we tend to trust authoritative symbols and many of which are easily forged. Next is intimidation. Intimidation 
here authority plays to our sense of duty right and people with authority or power above us are in a position to abuse that power we might feel that not complying would have a negative impact intimidation does not need to necessarily be so severe that one fears physical harm a social engineer would more likely use intimidation to play on the fear of getting in trouble or getting fired for example next is um, consensus or or and or social proof because people tend to trust like-minded people such as friends and family members they often believe what others around them believe think of the cliche um, safety numbers right we're more likely to put a tip in a tip jar when it is not empty for example and we might hesitate to eat, eat at a restaurant that is empty a social engineer might mention friends and colleagues to take advantage of this principle the attacker might say that these trusted people mentioned you or that they have already complied with whatever you are being asked for ambiguous requests or situations are more likely be to be acted on with the belief that others are doing the same thing or bought into the same situation Next is uh, scarcity and urgency. Scarcity is commonly used as a marketing ploy, right? And you have certainly heard a pitch about special pricing available to only the first 50 callers. Or perhaps you have heard tales of companies unable to keep up with demand. We tend to want or value something more if we believe it is less available. We are likely to be more impulsive if we believe something is the last one. A social engineer might use the principle of scarcity to spur someone to quickly act on a request before giving the request more thought. Right? Scarcity tends to work when the victim desires something and in return will act with a sense of urgency. Likewise, a social engineer can use urgency to gain support, perhaps saying that dreadful consequences will occur unless action takes place immediately. Next is uh, familiarity and liking. So here, people tend to comply with requests from those whom they like or have common ground with. Liking often leads to trust. A social engineer might use humor or try to connect more personally through shared interest or common past events and institutions. This can be effective because of our fundamental desire to establish and maintain social relationship with others. Social engineers who can get you to like them often find that you will be helpful because you too want to be liked. And the last one is trust. Trust plays a large role in all of these principles. We trust those with assigned authority. We trust those with specific expertise regarding their subject. Trust typically follows liking. We trust the consensus. Trust further is established and plays out in the idea of reciprocation. We are taught from an early age uh, the, the, about the golden rule, right? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. As a result, a social norm is established to create equity in social situations, to return favors, and not to feel indebted to anyone. All right, now let's talk about how not to be a victim of social engineering. So here are the things to remember. First is slow down. Spammers want you to act first and think later. If the message conveys a sense of urgency or uses high-pressure sales tactics, um, be skeptical. Never let urgency influence your careful review. Next is research the facts. Be suspicious of any unsolicited messages. If the email looks like it is from a company you use, do your own research. Use a search engine to go to the real company site or a phone directory to find their phone number. Third one is don't let a link be in control or where you land. Stay in control by finding the website yourself using a search engine to be sure that where you intend to land. However, uh, hovering over links in email will show the actual URL at the bottom, but a good fake can still steer you wrong. Next is uh, beware of any downloads. If you don't know the sender personally and expect a file from them, downloading anything is a mistake. Next is foreign offers are fake. If you receive an email from a foreign lottery or sweepstakes, money from an unknown relative or request to transfer funds from a foreign country for a share of the money, it is guaranteed to be a scam.
Let's talk about how to further protect yourself. So first is delete any request for financial information or password. So if you get asked to reply to a message with personal information, consider it as a scam. Next is a reject request for help or offers of help. Legitimate companies and organizations do not contact you to provide help. If you did not specifically request assistance from the sender, consider any offer to help restore credit scores, refinance at home, answer your question, and etc. could be a scam. Similarly, if you receive a request for help from a charity or organization that you do not have relationship with, just delete it. To give, seek out reputable charitable organizations on your own, to avoid falling for a scam. Another is to set your spam filters to high. Every email program has spam filters, right? To find yours, look at your setting options and set this to high. Just remember to check your spam folder periodically to see if legitimate emails has been accidentally being trapped there. You can also search for a step-by-step -step guide to setting up your spam filters by searching on the name of your email provider plus the phrase spam filters. And lastly is secure your computing devices. You might need to install antivirus software, firewalls, email filters, and keep these softwares up to date. Set your operating system to automatically update, and if your smartphone doesn't automatically update, manually update it whenever you receive a notice to do so. Use an anti-phishing tool offered by your web browser or a third party to alert you to risks. Alright, to provide a summary, social engineering is the art of manipulating people so they give up confidential information. Criminals use social engineering tactics because it is usually easier to exploit your natural inclination to trust than it is to discover ways to hack your software. You gotta be aware of common social engineering tactics such as dumpster diving, shoulder surfing, and different types of phishing, hoaxes, and many more. And lastly, remember to protect yourself using the guidelines provided on this lesson.